So uh, welcome everyone to another lecture in the Mellon Foundation Sawyer Seminar 2016 to 2017 at the University of Iowa on cultural and textual exchanges, the manuscript across pre-modern Eurasia. So today uh, we'd like to thank in addition to the Mellon Sawyer Funds, uh, the Ida Beam Visiting Lectureship uh, Foundation at the University of Iowa, as well as the Andrew Mellon Fellowship of Scholars in Critical Bibliography at the Rare Book School. So it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, as our second speaker of the, of the day, Dr. Susan Whitfield, who is a historian of medieval China and the Silk Road, as well as the head of the International Dunhuang Project at the British Library, where she is also curator of the Stein Collection and several others, uh, which amount to a staggering uh, 50,000 plus manuscripts in an equally staggering number of languages and formats and materials. Dr. Whitfield has lectured widely in Europe, East Asia, and the United States, and uh, her book, uh, Silk, Slaves, and Stupas, Material Culture of the Silk Road, uh, is eagerly awaited in 2017. So please join me in welcoming our speaker. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. And um, I would like to thank the organizers for bringing me here and you all for turning out on a Friday morning to listen. I'm going to give a very different talk from the first one presented today, which I found absolutely fascinating. So thank you, William, for that. I think it would be very interesting to sit down and just do a comparison of scrolls in different traditions, book scrolls, um, book rolls in different traditions, and look at these questions that were raised about scribal practices, about how the they were made so even in terms of their production, and all of these sort of questions. But I'm not going to do that. I will look very briefly at scrolls. But I'm a medievalist, and I consider myself a medievalist, even though these terms are quite difficult when we're talking in a global context. But for me, working in the Eurasia, and especially the eastern part of Eurasia, the idea of the movement from the book roll to the codex and the medieval period in late antiquity and the medieval period being dominated by the codex is not a story I recognize because in my part of the world that isn't what happens and in the part of the world I'm looking at we have a whole oh, gallimorphy a whole jumble of different formats of different materials of different languages Testing, testing. Can you hear? Okay, everybody. Can everybody hear? Okay or no? Okay. Just wave at me if you can't hear, and I'll speak up. Sorry, I'm a little bit croaky because I've had a no, cold. No so, um, okay, thank you. a whole jumble of different um, of different formats, of different languages, of different materials, of different probably scribal practices, and I'm just going to introduce some of those today to give you an idea of the range of material we're looking at and to throw out some questions about cross-cultural, inter-regional cultural, long-distance influences of these different formats. Um, not to answer those questions, just to throw them out and I hope we can discuss some of those um, in the question-answer session and in the seminar that's taking place later today because, and perhaps this afternoon when we're talking more about specific materials. Um, okay, shall I put the lights out so we can see? It's these two? No, just that one. No? Yeah, okay. Can you see? Yeah, I don't need it because I'm just. Um, so that's fine. Okay, so here we have a lovely picture from Dunhuang. And who's been to Dunhuang? I know a few of you have. There we go, a few <laughs> hands in the audience from the Eastern Silk Road of a Buddhist monk. Uh, we've moved from a Christian to a Buddhist tradition now, um, mainly, but it's just one of the many religions that, will, um, that occur in this area. I'm not going to be talking so much about religions, but a little bit. Um, reading from a scroll roll format. Um, and we'll, we'll examine this a little bit as we go along. Okay, just to get my 
terminology. The Silk Road is a very contentious concept. Whether it's useful or not is, we could have a whole seminar on that, but we're not going to do that. I'm just using it today to refer to a specific region and specific period, and that's trade routes across Eurasia um, and Africa from the end of the second century, beginning of the first century BC, through the first millennium and beyond. Most of my story today is set in the first millennium AD. Um, and just to give you a representation of Silk Road and all the trade routes that flowed by sea and land and steppe across um, Eurasian landmass, Afro-Eurasian Eurasian landmass at that time. Um, and the period, the place I'm going to be concentrating on is um, here, um, East and Central Asia, if you like, what is now Northwestern China, uh, Xinjiang, Gansu, Ningxia provinces in Northwestern China, but that traditionally has been culturally quite, um, had its own distinctive characters and has been very linked in. Now, the reason we have such rich resources from this, just to give you a bit of background about the collections that I and other curators worldwide um, look after from this region, is one, because it's desert. It's the Taklamakan, the Gobi Desert. So um, archaeological material has survived in many cases from the first millennium and before um, paper and other organic materials up until the present day when it was excavated. Um, many of the Silk Road cities were abandoned because of changes in water courses, so the sand went over them, just burying material and keeping it in relatively good condition for one, two thousand years. Um, and the second reason, another reason is um, because of, well, politics and archaeology. Um, mentioned, William mentioned earlier, the pro problem of provenance um, for some of the collections um, that he's looking at. In our case, we have very, very good provenance for almost all the collections we're looking at, which makes our life a lot simpler. And that's because in the 19th century, the two, two great imperial empires, the British Empire, who were in India, and the Russian Empire, so I'm giving a bit of history here, but um, that were in um, Central Asia, um, that have been fighting for the whole that time, making this area rather impossible for archaeologists and explorers to go to, had a rapprochement and um, signed treaties. And it became possible in the 1880s, 1890s, for travellers to start going to this region and to start exploring and excavating. I put up this picture here because this is the British consul um, in Kashgar, in what is now um, right at the northwestern part of China, George McCartney, shown with the local military leader, General Ma. I just like this picture because it shows something of this meeting of cultures. Well, there's lots of reasons I like this picture, but it does show something of this meeting of cultures, which is very much part of my talk today. Um, for a start, there, this is a traditional Chinese Tang seat, and normally you would sit cross-legged on this, um, with cushions and things. And of course, what they've done is put Western chairs on top of it. So you've got this wonderful meeting of the Chinese and the Western um, systems. It's also wonderful because if you look here, the general's son is just looking through the curtain there. And so he's immortalized um, young son. You probably can't see him very clearly. Um, and there's lots of other things to say about the photograph, but it's just to characterize the start of this period of rapprochement and the possibility of traveling to the region. And in the 1880s and 1890s, explorers started, travellers and explorers and politicians and diplomats started coming out with, of this region having travelled there with stories about these lost cities in the desert sands. And they also started bringing out some rare finds. One of the first manuscripts to come out was this. Um, it's on birch bark. At the time, it was an unknown script and language. Um, it's found in the 1890s in a place called, in a region called um, Khotan, Khotien, um, on the southern Taklamakan. I'll show you in a minute. Um, and it was unlike anything that people had seen before. Um, it's in roll format, and we'll return to this later. Also, 
the British and the Russian consuls, both based in Kashgar, started to be sold lots of material that they were told was coming out of the desert sands, um, including very strange objects like this, also in unknown script, unknown language. Um, and obviously, this got scholars very, very excited. An unknown script, and possibly a new language, is every scholar's, every linguist's dream to decipher the script and the language and make a permanent name for themselves as the sort of decipherer of that, of that script and language. And we'll return to, to both these pieces um, later on, so just keep them in mind. From the later 1890s, we start getting large imperial expeditions sent out by all the major powers of the time. Um, so the Russians, the British, the Germans, the Finns, the French, um, the Japanese, um, to this region. Um, this is Oral Stein, one of the most prolific of the travellers, um, whose collections are now in the various places, but mainly divided between the British Library, the British Museum, the V&A, and the National Museum of India in Delhi. Um, he was working for the, for the British in, um, in India, in Lahore, which was then in British India. Um, here we have the Germans, Grunwedel and Lecoq, um, who went, also went on four expeditions to this region. All these expeditions took place between sort of 1900 and 1920s, um, the early part of the 20th century. And they took, these people were away, well on his longest expedition, Stein was away for two and a half years in the desert excavating. So a significant amount of time looking for these old sites and digging and finding lots of archaeological material. Um, great French sinologist Paul Pellio, um, who also went out. And apart from digging in old ruined cities um, and finding archives and um, lost storage places and rubbish heaps, finding material, especially manuscripts and all these sorts of places, there was one particular manuscript find, um, which was at a place called Dunhong on the eastern part of the Silk Road, on the sort of boundaries of China proper. And it was a, in, a, um, in a site that was cave temples, Buddhist cave temples, um, excavated out of a cliff face to be act as chapels beautifully decorated, and a little um, chapel had been excavated from the side of one of these larger temples, and at some point, we don't know why, there's various theories, in the 10th century it had been filled floor to ceiling, and this is indeed the cave itself, with manuscripts, paintings, some paintings on silk and hemp and paper, but mainly manuscripts and early printed documents as well, and you can see them um, piled up here in this small cave, probably ooh, from about here to here, sort of that sort of size. 50,000 items. So in terms of a wonderful cache of documents, I mean, think of it like a Geniza, like the Cairo Geniza. I'm sorry you're not going to get the talk this afternoon on the Cairo Geniza because it would have been a nice comparison, but, um, but a wonderful array of stuff in... Um, over 15 languages and scripts, and I said on many different, um, mainly on paper, but on many different formats. Um, but apart, this is only one of the caches. I mean, altogether, there are probably, we don't know yet, because we're still sorting and numbering and conserving and putting them online, but probably 150,000 items from this period. So we have a very rich source of material, especially when we look at the tradition um, from other places um, of material to, to give us information about manuscript book tradition of this period. Um, Stein was, um, Pellio was there in 1908. The cave was discovered in 1900. Um, quite a lot of the material, all the material was moved out and quite a lot was given to local officials. And then Oral Stein, the British explorer, Hungarian-born British explorer, turned up in 1907 and acquired for a small amount of money a large number of crates of manuscripts which wended their way to the British Museum and 
now in the British Library collections. Um, Paul Pellio turned up the year after, in 1908, and sat in the space presumably vacated by the manuscripts acquired by Stein um, and read everything with a candle. Oh, history could have been so different. Here's a paper archive and a candle, but anyway, let's not go there. Um, and then um, the Chinese government cleared the cave of all the Chinese manuscripts in 1909-1910, but they probably didn't because some were probably secreted away, and the Russians and the Japanese and Stein all went there again. So this collection, along with the other collections of Silk Road, were divided um, and dispersed worldwide. Um, just a very, that's at the International Dunhong Project is a collaboration between all these institutions to put all this material, not just that from Dunhong, but from other archaeological sites together on the internet so you can look at it in one place. And we have about a um, quarter of a million images as of date. Um, now this area was, although it's now in northwestern China, and although it's variously ruled by the imperial powers on its boundaries, so you had the Chinese to the east at various points, you had the Tibetan Empire to the south, you had Turkic empires to the north, and you had other empires to the west and southwest, Iranian and Indian um, empires. Although it was very influenced or ruled by these, it had its own distinct cultures, own distinct kingdoms. And this is why perhaps we see such a variety of book formats uh, variety of languages and variety of book formats. The birch box piece I showed you earlier came, I said, from Khotan, which was a kingdom here that was very successful and survived for a thousand years. Its own language, its own art, its own culture. Is there a single monograph being written, a historical monograph on Khotan? No. Why not? I don't know. Go out there and do it. All study and start becoming the historians of this area because it desperately needs it. There's so much interesting stuff to do. Um, and that diversity is represented um, well by this diagram here, which shows the diversity of languages, um, languages and scripts found... Um, used in, uh, found on the manuscripts, um, on the manuscripts found in the area. So you can see the range from Tocharian Indo-European language, um, Khotan Sakha, Bactrian, um, Pavlavi, Persian, Greek, um, Sanskrit Indian languages, Sanskrit Prakrit, Tibetan, Mongolia, Tangut, all Sino-Tibetan languages, um, Chinese, Hebrew, um, script we find as well, Syriac and Arabic in the in manuscripts finds enormous diversity. And that diversity is also reflected in the types of formats and materials um, we find to a lesser extent. Okay, so let's just look at areas of influence um, first and formats that were coming in from outside and how they influenced um, the kingdoms of this region. And as I said, we're talking about the start of the Silk Road, so 1st century BC, 1st century AD here, when these trade routes started to become much more common. Of course, there had been trade routes before, but they started to become much better travelled. And when, importantly for our story, Buddhism travelled from its home in sort of northern India up through Central Asia and into this region. And... Um, and across by other ways into, into East Asia. Um, book formats in India, especially southern India, are the, the, a typical material. One of the typical main materials used is palm leaves. And so they tend to, in this format called poti, um, Sanskrit word, which is the shape of a palm leaf, like this, very long and thin. Palm leaves come in different shapes, so you do get different shapes and sizes of palm leaf because there are different varieties, but this is fairly typical. Um, <sighs> prepared and then written. Now, palm leaves are quite, quite friable, quite, um, and they can't be bound and they can't be stuck together. Um, they'd just be too friable for that. And so um, th what happened was they were 
well, you can see here, there's a string hole here. So a, they were bound by a loose piece of string put through any number of folios. And then they were kept inside, oh, sorry, um, wooden boards with a string wrapped round like this. And often the wooden boards were painted or the edges of the manuscripts were painted. And this is still a format used widely in South Asia and Southeast Asia um, today. Now, we don't get many palm leaves on the, in the Taklamakan Desert. There aren't many palm trees in the Taklamakan Desert. There aren't any palm trees at all in the Taklamakan Desert. Um, it's not the climate for it. But we do see images, um, this from a wall painting on the northern Taklamakan, of monks inscribing what appear to be poti shaped um, folios. But in fact, there's, you see they're different dimensions. They're not as long and thin as palm leaves are. Um, and that's because by this time we have paper, and paper dominates our story really of East and Central Asia, whereas we've been looking at papyrus and to a lesser extent parchment. In this part of the world, you know, paper is the dominant medium. Um, paper was invented maybe as early as the second, certainly by the first century BC in China, and by the first few centuries AD had become very assured technology. Beautiful paper could be made. And there were probably paper production centers throughout this region. Certainly they developed over the next few centuries. So the paper wasn't just brought from one region, it was made locally and often shows that in the choice of materials used to create the um, fiber, the pulp, to make the paper. Um, and you'll be learning lots more about paper making and all of this from on the workshop tomorrow from Mark when he chats a bit um, this afternoon, lectures a bit this afternoon. So while the top manuscript here, which is um, in Brahmi and Indian script, Sanskrit, Indian language, is a part of a palm leaf that's just broken off, the bottom one is a paper um, piece, um, also in Brahmi script, Tocharian. Um, Indo-European language used on the, probably it's, uh, speculated to be used on the northern Silk Road, but the same format with this damaged string hole. Um, so the, although palm leaves had dictated the, the, the shape of the, um, of the book, of the folios by necessity, because palm leaves come in a certain shape, when paper was brought in, that shape was replicated, not in exactly the same dimensions, but the same basic shape, the rectangular shape, was replicated in paper. And this was used across languages and cultures. So we even get Chinese, um, which is a vertical, written vertically, uh, right to left, so it's very different. Um, but we even get Chinese poti, and here you see again um, the string hole and just as margins and guidelines, which we do get a lot on um, Chinese books. We were talking about this in the earlier lecture about how scribes um, kept to, to their lines and um, kept everything so ordered. We get a lot of indications in, um, in Chinese texts, um, a lot of margins and guidelines used as well as um, pricked holes for guides and rulers and everything. So, um, and we can talk about this um, a bit later if you like. Um, paper wasn't the only material, palm leaf and paper. We also see leather. Um, this is a whole lot of material of written in Gandhari, the language of what is now Pakistan, um, northern India, Afghanistan, that region there, um, in Karoshti, a script only used in Central Asia from the first to fourth centuries, so it's quite easy to date this stuff, first to fourth centuries AD. Um, just plain leather, not, not treated leather. Um, and we even get birch bark um, poti, um, such as this top one here. Um, found at Kucha. Um, but the same format being replicated in different materials for different languages and different scripts. So it became, becomes a very 
well used and well recognized format in this region. Um, birch bark, again, isn't really found, it's found a bit in the Tian Shan and again in Gandhara in this region of um, northern India and Pakistan. Um, and it was more typically used from scrolls as the first, one of the first scrolls I showed you found at Khotan from this region. Um, that was a scroll, one of the first manuscripts I showed you. This is a very typical birch bark scroll. You can see these were stored in scroll format and rather look like old cigars and are an absolute nightmare to conserve. And my colleague um, Mark will be talking a bit about that later. Um, it's not the most durable of materials and it's thanks to Mark that in fact this piece is probably conserved so um, that we have anything at all from this crumbling bit of um, cigar thing we see here. So, um, but this was a, a local material. You didn't, I mean, you might export materials, but you obviously you try to find something locally. And it'd be interesting to talk a bit about um, adoption and non-adoption of, of technologies, new technologies and new materials, a bit perhaps in the discussion or in the seminar later, because oh, I think that's quite an interesting question to look at. Um, the use of paper, as I said, meant that the dimensions of the poti, if not the general um, form, the long, thin form with um, string holes, could be changed. So in Tibet, where the poti was used ubiquitously for Tibetan Buddhist material um, throughout um, this period, throughout the first millennium, we see much, much larger um, well, we see a whole variety of shapes of poti, from quite small ones like this to ones like this, which is which are about this big, very, very large um, folia. Um, and you see sometimes they have one, sometimes they have two string holes. The interesting thing about paper is the string holes, there's a bit of controversy about that, but the string holes rarely show signs of wear, suggesting they weren't actually used, that they were there replicating the format, but they weren't there, they were there for, not for use, not, um, but they were replicating an, or, an, another format, so they were kept. Um, they're sometimes decorated as well. Uh, I should say there's a bit of controversy because in a few cases, little strands of string have been found, so perhaps in some cases they were used. Um, but uh, yeah, um, I think in many cases they weren't. It was it was just replicating the, um, the form. So we've seen the poti come in from India, especially South India, moving up and being used throughout this whole region, including the Tibetan um, Empire of the time. Um, at the same time, from both. Here, from the Gandharan region, what is said now, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and from East Asia, China, we get the scroll format um, in use. That's the typical format, the book roll, um, in use in both these regions. In this region, as I've shown, it's on birch bark, and rolled up and stored, not in your ice bucket, as in, um, you know, your... Um, <laughs> Greek ones, but in the ones we've that have been found have been stored in big terracotta pots. But that's probably when they've been used for um, archiving. Whether they were stored like that for everyday use, um, um, we don't know. Um, in China, the rolls were stored inside um, in wrappers about 10 to 15 rolls per wrapper. A cloth wrapper was made, wrapped around them, tied at the top. Sorry, I didn't put a slide in, um, but I have got a slide, which we can find later if you want to see it, um, of such a wrapper, sutra wrapper. And then they were put from what we know inside a sort of pigeonhole type system. Um, so just to go back um, quickly, this is uh, birch bark manuscript we saw that was found in the 1890s from um, Khotian, from Khotan, 
um, Kharoshdi on birch bark and was, would have been scrolled for storage. Um, this is one you just saw that um, Mark conserved um, now in, um, some of these are in the British Library and some in University of Washington in Seattle. Um, in China, um, just to go back a step, the scroll on paper is preceded by, before the invention of paper, by um, two materials, two main materials, silk and wood. Silk um, was prepared for writing um, and was very easy, a good material to write on. It was very light, very portable, it was rolled up, very easy and still I mean, continues to be used. I mean, um, throughout the Second World War, a lot of escape maps were written on little pieces of silk so they could be sewn inside clothes. It's very light and portable and um, easy, to, easy to transport, but expensive. Silk was not cheap. Um, the other main material in pre-paper China were, was wood. And um, wood slips like this were used of various sizes. Uh, but ones like this, this is a part of an almanac from the first century BC. Um, found at actually the, the defences uh, north of Dunhuang, the Dunhuang defensive walls, what's now called the Great Wall, but um, defensive walls north of Dunhuang. But um, these would have been, you can see the notches, little notches on them just here um, and here. I don't know how clearly you can see, just running along on this side. They would have originally been joined together into sort of scrolls, if you like. And then there's a bit of controversy about whether they were stored by being rolled in sort of roll format or by being concertinaed up. And maybe both was used depending on the size of the wood. And the, um, wood was very cheap, very plentiful, but very heavy to transport around, so not an ideal material. Um, but it was, it did continue to be in use, as we'll see, um, throughout, throughout the period in question. So when paper came in, it, um, it superseded both these materials as the main um, material of choice for your fine manuscript scroll or your writing material. Um, made out of fibres of various plants, there is mulberry trees, paper mulberry and the silk mulberry and other um, trees out of hemp, rami, whatever you could find really locally. Um, you had paper from very, very high grade paper, which was very expensive to quite low rough made paper. But if you were producing something like a very fine manuscript scroll, the ones we were looking at earlier on papyrus, the Greek ones, you would use the very finest um, paper, often made in central China or in southwest China and imported from there um, to make a scroll like this. Um, just to say a couple of things about the, the scroll. Um, one is it has a, it's wrapped around a wooden roller. You can just see the ends here and here. Um, the wood is often decorated. Sometimes it has inlays, mother of pearl, lacquer at the end, the pieces sticking out of the scroll. So the beginning of the scroll, remember you're reading from right to left. So the beginning's over here or over here, if you're looking at you, um, was wrapped around this roller, and then it was all wrapped around, and at the end there was a stave, a wooden stave, sometimes reed or bamboo, just um, folded inside the end of the paper here to attach um, a fine bit of reinforcement in which you attached a silk tie, which then wrapped around the scroll and stopped it falling apart when you dropped it accidentally. So <laughs> it didn't skedaddle across the floor and you didn't break your hip trying to pick it up. So <laughs> definite advantage there. Um, and you can see here unrolled. Um, now, the one thing about a Chinese writing, of course, is that you don't have columns because you go down from right to left. So the writing is continuous, so you have no need for margins or intercolumn um, spaces, um, which makes it a much more useful form um, for a scroll. But as I said, you do often get, on many of these finest manuscripts, 
um, top and bottom margin, margins and guidelines. And on the very finest ones, um, we'll get a set number of columns per panel of paper, a set number of characters, Chinese characters, per column. So they're very, very regular. And you get the same sense, as William was talking about this morning, of the scribes who are used to writing hundreds of thousands of words and got very, very um, skilled at coming out with um, copying these manuscripts. Um, title was also written on the outside. Ignore this. This is a modern edition. And then, if you imagine them stored in the cubby hole, of course, you couldn't see the title because it wasn't sticking out like a spine of a book does, like a spine of a codex. But often, and we have many still existing, what would be attached was a little tab here with the uh, shortened form of the title on. So when it was sticking out, the tab would sort of stick down, hang down from the edge of the manuscript, if you can imagine, so you could read what the title was without having to take the whole thing out and unroll it and look at each one individually. Um, and as I said, we still have quite a lot of manuscripts with that material on. Um, just a couple of other points of, of reference to, to the earlier lecture. And I, we can, as I said, we can discuss these. I don't want to go to them in any great detail. But of course, we don't have punctuation of in Chinese at this time. And so just as in the Greek text, each character, which is not necessarily a word, but each character is more or less evenly spaced um, without any indication of where the end, the beginning of a sentence or um, anything is. Sometimes you do, you have paragraphs, so you do have um, the end of a paragraph halfway down a column and the next one starting on the next column. Um, this is Buddhist and we have to bear in mind that Buddhist scrolls, a large proportion of them were written to replicate the word of the Buddha sends merit to your, gives merit to yourself for your karmic rebirth and sends merit out into the world and is said to be a better act than any amount of alms giving or whatever to replicate the word or the image of the Buddha, which was why we have in Buddhist caves all these replicated Buddha images. It's a way of sending out merit. It's why we have so many of these manuscripts. A lot of these manuscripts were written, um, paid for by patrons um, as an act of um, as a religious act and some of them might hardly have been used the, you know, the writing of them was the act in itself and then they might have been stored away and very little used we have quite a few with notes on the end telling us about why they were copied um, some of them were copied and then were used and we see lots of evidence something like this obviously wasn't used very much because it's in such beautiful condition um, before it's put in the cave. Um, if manuscripts were used, very often they were being recited. So there's no need for going to a certain place in the text. You just had to recite them as you went along. And so scroll form was a very convenient form for that. You could roll through reciting, as you showed in your lectures when you were giving um, a lecture using a, a scroll. You know. um, so I think when we're thinking about the suitability of formats, it's quite interesting doing, doing that comparison between some of these early Greek texts and some of these Chinese Buddhist scrolls. But let's, let's explore that more perhaps in the, in the discussion later. Um, unlike the Greek scrolls, the panels, you, you bought the paper in panels in its separate panels, and the panels were a set size, panels of paper, and you worked out how many panels you needed for the scroll you were having copied. And we know this because we have quite a lot of notes saying, oh, this needed 28 panels, but I could only find 27, or it was difficult to get paper, and it took me a long time to get the requisite number of panels of paper for this. And then you would get a person who would 
stick them together and make the format, and then the scribe who would actually do the copying of the text. Um, and something like this, like your finest Greek roll, would have been a very expensive production. And many of them are copied by individuals, but sometimes they're copied by groups of people as well. Um, but we do get a, a range of different material. So we've been learning, um, looking at comparisons, or learning about um, tradition across the other side of the world. We can talk a bit about whether there were any influences. Um, Later, we have no, no sign that there were. But this scroll format, while in um, at the other side of Eurasia, the scroll was being replaced um, more and more by the codex format, um, this scroll format remained ubiquitous throughout the first millennium AD um, in this part of the world, in East Asia and East Central Asia. I would say it's partially because it was so fit for purpose. There was no need for um, changing it for, for what it was required for. Um, we do get illuminated scrolls as well. This is a sutra of the a Buddhist sutra of the Ten Kings of Hell. Um, so it's rather nice. It shows all the rebirths. When you die, you go in front of all these kings, um, magistrates. Um, judges um, at various periods after your death and they look at your your actions during your life and decide what's going to happen to you um, and in the Chinese version after three years you go and see the final king King Yama and he decides whether you're going to be reborn as a Buddha because you've paid off all your karmic debt or a bodhisattva, or whether you're going to be a hungry ghost, or an animal, or whether you're going to end up in hell itself, which is depicted over here. So, <coughs> now, while paper was used widely for the finest manuscripts, but also for other material, as I said, wood continued to be used um, throughout this region. It was cheaper, probably, well, almost certainly, it was um, very available. This is desert, but you did have lots of poplar trees, um, lots of fruit trees. Most of the wood slips do seem to be poplar. Um, and it was used for ephemeral documents in all the cultures. So um, almanacs obviously had an interest for one year. Almanacs only last a year. Um, a lot of military documents. These are Tibetan military tallies that were stuck on supplies and you see the um, bits being cut out here so the person accepting the supply the two bits of wood the bit that was attached to the bag of grain or whatever and then the soldiers in their garrison who had this little corner cut out here they had to match so that we could see that the supplies were coming to the right place um, I say a lot of these wood slips as well once they uh, fulfilled their primary purpose, in this case as said to, to provide supplies to soldiers out in the field, were recycled um, as various things. So some you see fashioned into spoons, for example, or into little scrapers, and even into what are euphemistically called toilet scrapers. <laughs> you can use your imagination on that one. Paper was also, uh, paper manuscripts were also used a lot for toilet paper. Um, we know this because it's like the Ganesas, that's why I mentioned it before, um, in, in Chinese and Buddhist tradition as well, text with, uh, text, manuscripts, um, material with writing on was held to be um, important in itself. It wasn't something you would throw away at the end with sacred text on, even if you'd f it finished its purpose. If it was a Buddhist sutra or a Confucian text, it would be disrespectful to throw it away, so you would keep it or um, somewhere. And we do have one very disgruntled comment by a, um, a scholar 
um, around this time who says how disgusted he is that people, he's finding that old Confucian texts are being cut up and used as toilet paper, which is very disrespectful to the original text. So um, very useful this because we know toilet paper was used and that it was like newspapers, you know, um, used from old manuscripts. Um, but what we get apart from these wood slips, which are very just functional um, ephemeral documents, we also get wood being used for much more important and archival documents um, in this region and throughout this whole area. And then we get some very interesting forms. And I'm only going to show you a couple today, but they are, I think, rather fascinating. And I don't know of any precedent. I don't know where these forms come from. I um, mean, it seemed not that they had to have come from anywhere. They could have just been invented locally, but it's interesting in itself. Um, this is written in this script called Karoshti that I mentioned was used to the first to fourth, first to fourth century in, um, in this region and in Gandhara. This was found um, on the southern Silk Road in Kingdom, which um, controlled that area during this period. Um, and you see the wood's been fashioned... So it sort of forms a type of envelope. This concerns a judgment about a farmer who's run away leaving all his debts um, and all his duties. And the king of the region is writing that he needs to be found and sent back to pay off his debts and carry out his farming duties. So, and this and other documents I'm showing you were found in archives of local magistrates. So they were there to be kept. And the judgment's written on here, there's a little summary or synopsis on the outside. And then the um, two bits of wood are put together. There's a string hole here so that they can be tied at this end. And at this end, string is tied round, and then there's a clay seal put in this hole here. So the whole thing is sealed. Um, presumably, should that judgment need to be revisited, they can get it out of storage, and it can be shown that it hasn't been tampered with. Should, and um, so, and we still have some of the clay seals and um, um, in situ. So, very very interesting format. Um, as I said, I leave it to you to think about where possible influence or why this format, how and why this particular format was invented. Um, why did the local peoples come out with this type of um, of of yeah, of form. Um, a few centuries later, um, this is 8th century, in the neighbouring kingdom of Khotan, the place where we saw the birch box scroll, and where we see a great variety of influences, we have another wonderful set of wooden documents, also found from um, archives, um, like this, which are similar in the same sort of way in that they have a summary, they're legal documents, this concerns a case of water rights, obviously we're in the desert, so the right to water is very important. Um, a summary is on the outside of the judgment, the case has been heard, and then the whole case is written on the inside, on the underside of this piece and on here, and then slotted in, um, and again there's holes in the bottom here and the bottom piece so that string can be put around and can be sealed. And we have very distinctive formats, two, um, four or five different types of very distinctive formats used for different sorts of, of legal cases and different, um, different types of document. Um, just something which is, I think, very, well, I haven't seen anything like this anywhere else. I'd be very interested if anybody has. And so a lot of care and attention has gone in, into making this because this has to slide in very well. I mean, you need a good carpenter to make something like this. Um, why not have a paper scroll or a much simpler piece? Why this level of complexity? Anyway, we do. So we have quite a, um, well, scores of, of items like this. Um, and, of course, at the same time, I don't want to suggest that the scroll is the only format. We have lots of, um, used in paper, we have lots of more just workaday documents which survive from this region, um, which are just in single sheets, for example, letters, lots of letters. Um, let me see, how am I doing for time? 
such as this one, which is a um, fourth century, early fourth century letter written in Sogdian. And I can come back to it and tell you because it's just a beautiful letter, um, fascinating, um, which was. Um, you can see the fold marks here. You can see the damage marks here where it's been folded. So it's been folded over and then um, crossed. So it's, it's ended up as a little tri a little rectangle like this of paper once it's been folded and that. And the address has been put on the outside. A little bit of there's a little bit of um, silk attached. These things are probably tied. And the address was put on the outside. The addressee. Um, there weren't postmen as such at this time. These would have probably been given to, this was going from Dunhuang to Samarkand. Um, it would have probably been given to a local Sogdian who was going back, traveling back through Dunhuang to Samarkand. And he would have picked up letters for his fellow countrymen as he went, ready to take them back to, um, to hand them out when he got back home. Um, this one never got there for various reasons. and. Um, or we have um, an, another piece here. Um, again, um, this is a, um, sorry, a very nice piece. This is in um, Cotonese, the Cotan, the place I was talking about, Cotonese language written in Brahmari script. This is from a soldier who's stationed in um, a garrison Cotonese soldier in Tibet, and he's writing back to his um, family, to his wife, saying, oh, you need to do this and do that to make sure the pomegranates don't dry out, and you need to fertilize fields and do this to, to give her instructions for the farming year ahead, because he's been sent off on military service. Um, I should say there's other interesting discussions perhaps to be had following on again from this morning's lecture about the level of literacy in these societies at this time, because this is not from a highly educated member of the elite. This is from a probably middle-ranking farmer. I mean, he's, you know, he's not a um, tenant farmer. He's probably got some rank. But um, and this one, which is from a Sogdian merchant's wife, um, again, it's from a woman, and um, there's there's interesting things to be said about how ubiquitous text was in, in these societies, even used by the semi-literate or non-literate, it still had a power and a use among those communities. It wasn't just the preserve of the elite. Um, and just a third single sheet letter um, is this. This is a commercial document from, it's in Hebrew script, Jew, um, Persian language, um, concerning the sale of sheep. Um, because beginnings and the ends of the sentences, lines are cut off. It's very difficult to make sense of the whole, but um, it does seem to be a commercial document from, a, um, from the same region. Um, OK, just to go back to, so I've shown you some of the different formats and some of the different languages and materials we're getting at this time. Just to go back and look at some of the intersections we get, the interesting hybrids we get when those different cultures meet. We've already seen how poti palm leaves become different shapes, even though they're still basic, um, long and thin, like these Tibetan um, paper ones. What we see is when the um, poti and the scroll format intersect, we get an interesting hybrid like that. This, and this is one of my favorite pieces, um, this is a copy of a Buddhist sutra. The sutra is actually in Tibetan, written in red, but the black is a commentary on the sutra, which was probably written first. Well, it appears it was written first, and then the sutra was added um, in red after. It might have been used as a teaching text um, to, to discuss this sutra. And when you read the Tibetan, um, you're looking at it like this, and it looks like a poti that's just been joined together. And it's got the, even though the pages are joined, um, it's still got the string hole replicating this poti format. So it's, it's to all intents and purposes, a joined together poti. But of course, when you reorient it to read the Chinese, it becomes like a folded up scroll. It's a concertina. 
Um, and this is emerging about 8th, 9th century um, in this region. And 9th, 10th century, particularly, we start then to see the rise um, use of codex much later elsewhere. Um, and we get them in many different forms and many different languages. Um, since the material we have from is mainly up until sort of 10th, 11th, 12th centuries, we're just on the sort of cusp of that. So it's usually in the sort of 11th, 12th, 13th century that this form becomes more dominant. And our material sort of bridges that, um, that, that change. Um, scroll continues to be used, though. Um, so here we have a little, this is a book of omenology. Um, written in Old Turkic and written in runic script with a Chinese Buddhist text. Um, the leather binding is entirely the British Museum's influence. It's book binding department. It has nothing to do with the original. Um, Chinese and book, Central Asian books were not bound in hard copies when Codex came in. They were soft bound. They would often have a um, silk pasted on to the front and back of the paper to form a sort of cover, but there wasn't a hard binding as such in leather or wood or anything like that. It was, um, it was soft binding um, that continues. Um, we get other pieces like this. This is a delightful little booklet. You see, you can probably see something that the paper's much rougher than many of the papers I've showed you before. It's quite a, not such a ex much cheaper paper than the other. And the calligraphy is quite rough as well. This is much cheaper production than the scroll format we saw before. So much more likely to be a personal copy made for someone. Um, and it's a, simply bound in that the pages are just pieces of paper folded over. Um, and then they're just tied with a little piece of string through a hole in the top right. So it's a very, very simple binding. Um, this is actually chapter 25 of the Lotus Sutra, which is called the Avalokiteshvara Sutra, because Avalokiteshvara, for those of you who know Buddhism or don't know Buddhism, is the bodhisattva um, of compassion. And bodhisattvas are those beings who stay on earth to help all us unenlightened beings reach enlightenment, and they delay their, their movement to their transfer to enlightenment to help us unenlightened beings get there. And at such time as we all move into enlightenment, then they too will become Buddhas. Um, so they're, they're beings of compassion. And Avalokiteshvara is particularly well known because um, he would help out if you were in any difficulties, you could just call an Avalokiteshvara. So if you were being held up at gunpoint, you go, Avalokiteshvara, and then suddenly the the muggers drop down, or you're imprisoned, and you call on a Palakiteshra. And so the whole, this chapter 25 tells of all these different instances of being attacked by sea monsters, or whatever it is, consumed by flames, and a Palakiteshra comes and helps you out. And then illustrated with these little, um, quite crude, but quite charming illustrations at the top. And this one shows when this couple are calling an Avalokiteshvara because they can't have a child and they want a child. And here, nine months later, is indeed birth happening because Avalokiteshvara has met their wishes. This is still something, um, if you go, for example, to Hong Kong or other places, you will still see shrines to Avalokiteshvara, who takes on female form later in this period, still a male form, but takes, later takes on female form, you'll still see, see local shrines for Valakiteshra where people put up things asking for children. So it's still a tradition that's followed today. Um, but this might well have been made as a, um, as a, just a personal copy for someone, a much um, cruder, um, much cheaper um, production. Um, just another, oh, actually this one's quite interesting. Um, just to say, for those of you interested, we do have a website on the different forms of um, the scrolls, the poti, and these early book formats um, online, which 
which is there. Um, we're just updating the website at the moment. So apologies for any, it will be showing glitches and going down quite a lot over the next few months as we put up the new website. But um, if you can be patient and just wait a few months, then you'll have a whole new, much better website there. Um, I just wanted to say quickly about this, because it touches on something earlier. Um, we were talking about, we know that scribes copied, um, we talk about copying how texts were copied, we know that scribes copied text. Um, but even a text like this, which was done as a personal votive offering, this was made, and we know from the end of it, by an old man of 83, um, as an act of merit for various things that had happened. And it was also considered meritorious if you wrote with your own blood. So he says in the note at the end that he had pricked his finger and mixed his blood with the ink and written out. This is a copy of the Diamond Sutra. And he says also that it's taken, copied from the true printed copy of the Guo printers in um, Xichuan. Um, now, Xichuan is an area just to the south south of Dunhuang, what is now Sichuan, southwestern China, which was a great area for printing um, at this time. Um, so he was using the printed copy as the sort of master copy. Um, and that just brings me on to the final thing, which I'll whiz through because we're rushing out of time, is just I wanted to mention briefly printing because Mark is going to be talking about the Diamond Sutra later. And of course, apart from the move to all the different formats and the start, the appearance of the codex towards the end of the millennium, um, we also see the start of printing. My question is, why did printing take so long? Because there'd been basic printing there before in cylinder seals or ordinary seals, that's printing. Um, I think there are different answers for that. Why you don't always adopt technologies because you don't always need technologies. Um, technologies are taken, if it's put into adopting them if they're useful, and maybe only printing only became useful at a certain time. Printing in China was done um, on wood blocks, although we do have early movable type as well um, in the 10th, 11th centuries. Um, but printing in China seems, or in East Asia, seems to have been developed about 700. This is one of the earliest printed. Um, but undated um, uh, rolls um, found in a tomb in Korea, thought to date from about 700, it's a Korean piece. So printing is thought to have been invented by about 700, maybe a bit before. Um, in Japan, we have the Empress Shotoku, who had all these Durrani, Buddhist Durrani, printed on these little, tiny, tiny little um, rolls like this and put inside um, stupas, wooden stupas, and distributed throughout the empire. And then, of course, um, by 868, we have the earliest dated printed book in the world, but by this time, product of a very, very mature industry, the Diamond Sutra, um, which was found at Dunhuang, which Mark is going to talk about, so I'm not going to steal his thunder. <laughs> um, but just to say, when I started digitization in the early 90s and the use of the internet, one of the most active groups of people working at that time who realized the power of digitization were Buddhists. And they were all digitizing Buddhist texts. And they were digitizing Buddhist texts and Buddhist images because of this, um, this, this, this um, belief that replicating the words of the Buddha is an act of merit. So if you can find somewhere to replicate them, like prayer wheels, replicate them more quickly with less effort, then you get more merit for less effort. So it's purely, you know, a win-win situation. And so we see Buddhists using paper when paper was invented. You know, they seem to have developed and really pushed that because paper was a very good way of providing a very durable, cheap, relatively cheap, um, way of reproducing images of the Buddha. We see them then in the, this time, in the 7th, 8th, ninth centuries, really using printing 
because for the same reasons, it was a way of replicating the words of the Buddha, and hence documents like the Diamond Sutra. Um, and we see them in the in the 20th, 21st century using digitization. So there's a for them there's a great imperative, which is piety for the use of these new technologies. Um, there was another group that also saw the advantage of printing, and that was the profit element. And those were private printers who produced almanacs in early China in great numbers. Um, and this is an early printed almanac from 877. And we have many printed almanacs, remains of printed almanacs from the 9th, 10th centuries, at a time when it was forbidden by Chinese law for the private printing of almanacs. So we know um, that they were being produced against, um, in contravention of the, of the law at the time. So again, that's, I'm just throwing that out as a reason for why technologies are sometimes why technologies are, are um, adopted by certain groups. Um, just say one more thing before I, f well, two more things before I finish, because I just want to return to the document I showed you right at the beginning. Um, we're looking across Eurasian influences, and I haven't su really suggested any yet, but one that has been partially looked at and is a fascinating study is that sort of around the 8th, 9th century. We've seen most of the paper I've shown you so far has been dyed yellow, which was in Chinese imperial colour and became very much a Buddhist colour. And the dye used had insecticidal and water repellent properties as well, so it was very good. But at this time, um, around the 8th, 9th century, we start seeing the use of indigo dyed paper and gold and silver ink being used to write in it for Buddhist sutras. And here's a fragment of one such um, one such um, scroll from, from Dan Hong. Of course, right at the other half side of the world, so it's a bit bright, that slide, um, we see purple dyed, um, blue dyed parchment written on in gold and silver ink for the Quran. Um, and there's been some discussion about whether there was, could have been any influence between the arising of both these traditions. I leave that open. Finally, I just want to return to this piece here, which I showed you, if you remember, right at the beginning, as one of the pieces that had come to light in the 1880s, 1890s, sold to the British and Russian consuls by two enterprising um, people in Khotan. Well, of course, over the next decades, as more and more stuff was unearthed in the desert and found at Dunhuang, nothing like this came to light. At the time, remember, nothing from here had been excavated. So when something like this came out, you hadn't got any comparison. It could have been the format that was used at this time by these people. There was, you just didn't know. Um, and there was a scholar who did spend 10 years of his life trying to decipher these manuscripts, of which there are 100 plus um, manuscripts and printed documents, because some of them were printed, um, only for um, to be told, I mean, he was he it was suggested to him several times, but he ignored it. Um, but he finally, incontrovertible evidence was given him that these were forgeries just made by these locals, realizing the interest in material, and they just put together these rather bizarre objects and sold them to these unsuspecting foreigners um, and made quite a lot of money. Um, the incontrovertible, um, they they would claim to have been found in the desert here and were sold in to the consuls in Kashgar here. And one of the sellers was this man, Islam Arkun. Um, and Stein, Oral Stein, when he went on his first expedition in 1900, 1901, on his way back, he managed to get Islam Arkun into a little room and shone a light into his eyes and interrogated him for three days. And Islam Arkun finally came clean and admitted that he'd been making them him and his colleague just be making these things to sell to these colleagues. So um, Stein took a picture of him and let him go because he didn't want to hand him over to the authorities at that time because his punishment might have been rather severe. He did come to a, 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 a come run foul of the law some years later as well. So he was obviously a bit of a dodgy character. But just to say that, of course, through all this, um, 
we do always have to be careful of provenance and of not being misled by things that don't come from where they say they are or aren't made when and where they claim to be. It's not a big issue for us, but it is something we need to keep aware of all the time. Okay, thank you. Um, in short, um, no, nothing that systematic has been done because we still haven't got a complete list of all the manuscripts from Van Hong. We're still doing so much foundational work on this material. So work has been done on various bits and pieces of these collections, but the overall, you know, we're probably talking and said 150,000 plus, I mean, from Don Hong, 50,000, but from all these different regions, 150,000 plus 200, maybe quarter of a million manuscripts. And some are in private collections, some are in, haven't been conserved, um, so they're not even numbered, so they're not even available. So we're still going through the beginning stages in many ways of this material, which is why we need all of you to come and work for us and, you know, take on the studies further, because there's so much to do. So no, I mean, a little work's been done on various things, but it's always been done on subsets, so it's quite difficult to tell. Uh, let me just take a question from there first, and I'll come back to you too. Sorry, just just say again. Just. Um, so um, I saw that uh, the version of the picture yes. um, could it be to uh, the book that I Yeah, interesting question. Um, um, you get inscriptions. Oh, so the question was whether the vertical nature of Chinese writing was influenced by the form of the wood slips. But in fact, before wood slips, we do have Chinese writing in on other materials. So oracle bones, the earliest form, which, um, and then bronze inscriptions and things, which it could be easily written the other way. So no, it's a very very interesting perceptive question, but um, we do have earlier materials. So, um, but of course, it might have been the other way around that the vertical nature of Chinese writing made wood slips very convenient for it. Um, no. um, so, <clears throat> at the British Library, can you give us a sense of, of the fifty thousand or so manuscripts? How many of them have been cataloged? <laughs> yeah, I can. <coughs> <coughs> when I've just had a coughing fit. Um, I was shocked at all the work I've still got to do. Um, we've got basic records on about 50,000. We're still conserving some, and I mean basic, I don't mean full catalogues. A lot of these fragments, as we were talking earlier, William was talking earlier, I've been showing you complete stuff. We have, you know, thousands and thousands tens of thousands of fragments like this with three characters on or three syllable syllables or whatever so you know um, it's going to be many many years before anybody says well that's part of that text um, but in having basic information language script size blah the the vast majority the only stuff we haven't done in the British Library is some um, Tanga material, shisha material, which is still in the bundles it came from, from the desert. And we just got money from Conservator to work on that now. So that is all being done. Um, fuller catalogues, much smaller number, but probably about a quarter. In terms of numbers digitized, um, two thirds in terms of numbers of material. Um, but a lot of the digitized stuff has been, is fragment, it's a fragmentary material. So it only requires two images. Um, in terms of the numbers of images, we have still a lot of, you know, 10, 15, 20 meter long scrolls. 
that require a lot more than two images to digitize them. So in terms of the number of images, probably about a third of the way through. But yeah, we're only one collection among many. There you go, <laughs> some of the collections, yes. Yeah, so um, you probably know this, but it's, it's a little bit interesting in terms of cross-cultural influence. The roles that you show are beautiful in particular. Uh, you mentioned the title tag. Uh, so that happens in the prequels, too, or the prequels is syllabus, mm -hmm. and the summary of the second year syllabus, and mm -hmm. then the Latin is titulus, which is a word. Title and the prequels also have the what we call Hindu yeah. So, so I, I, I wonder if you could talk to that. I mean, is there is there some strong root that is flowing, you know, sort of backstreaming from from Rome? Um, I think it's probably just the case that if you're making scrolls and putting them like that, that's a practical way of doing them. And both those cultures came out without. Separately, I don't think there's any strong evidence to show that there was a um, influence between those two things. Um, but you know, I think it, one should keep an open mind. But you know, um, if you've got something, how are you going to coming? You know, roll out. How do you see what its title is without pulling it out? You have to put something. Yeah, but then it's it's stored this way in. So, I mean, it's stored like this. So the title's here. So, you you want the title sticking out here. So it sticks outside your cubby hole, so to speak. So, um, yeah, yes. No, I mean, I think that's why we should have more occasions like this and talk more and study more because we're still in the dark about these things. Um, Tim, I think you had a question. I just a quick question, not to complicate your courageous and heroic effort here. I'm just curious. <laughs> courageous and heroic effort. You know, I mean, it's pretty awesome. Uh, in your discussions about scanning, is there any uh, conversation about uh, transmitted light images of some of the, the objects on paper? Because it tells the paper makers so much. Yeah, we do do transmitted light sometimes, and we're always happy if people come, and we sometimes get scholars. We've had a Japanese scholar come in and do quite a lot of, um, um, using a keyance doing um, um, morphology of the paper. Um, we'll always put those images up if we do them. Obviously, our primary aim, and we have to raise funds to do all this, is to just get the material out there. So, um, but we're always happy to do that, and I know it's important. And we'll do infrared sometimes, um, um, different sorts if it's if it's warranted and if we have funding. Um, and as I said, if somebody else does it, we'll host it as well. So, um, sorry, you had a question. Oh. <clears throat> Mine wasn't really. Uh, uh, anything more than a speculative question. Um, so I'm not assuming that influences go from mm. west to east, from Europe to mm. China, but it does seem to me that since we know that the seal, the notion of the seal got trans, the rolling seal got transmitted. You see it in uh, Mesopotamia, you see it in the Harappan culture, um, and the scroll is on both ends of the route that we know Ionian sculptors went along, for example, why couldn't it have been made more common by being something that traders on both ends would recognize as being a book? Why not indeed? I'm not saying it isn't. I'm just saying there's plenty of earlier evidence that showed that form was coming out in China with the silks and with the yeah you know, anyway. And it's a much more natural form for Chinese writing because, I mean, I find it, you know, when you have these columns that are divided, it's less obvious form for scroll format. It's much more obvious form for codex format if you have right to left with um, margins. Whereas if you have top to bottom um, going along, then that's perfect for scroll format anyway. Um, it could have been the other way, of course. Yeah, I'm not talking no. about codex. Just yeah, no, no, yeah. Um, look, I, as I said, 
I'm completely open-minded about this. Um, I think we know far too little to come out with firm answers about many of these questions yet. I think we just need to answer the que ask questions, throw them out there, and let them remain out there until we build up such um, evidence that gives us stronger, um, stronger answers one way or another. I mean, even, even if we uh, discount the idea that there was a transfer of technologies oh. or something like that, I, it's almost equally or even more striking that such similar formats were created, uh, you know, independently, you know. So, yeah. not saying one or the other, but even if it was independent, that would be pretty striking, too, because mm -hmm. all of the other formats that you showed, like the Pussy book, uh, you know, don't really have good... Uh, Corollaries in, in West Eurasia, so mm -hmm. but on opposite ends, there are these uh, extremely similar. Uh, and on the note of kind of cataloging similarities, did I notice? Uh, so it looked like uh, there was uh, the in, in one of the paper scrolls you showed there was uh, ruling. So it was ruling. no, it said yeah, there were margins and guidelines as as we call them. So um, no, 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 no. On the on the scroll. Yeah. Um, I mean, you even. I mean, you can't see. Sometimes you get them on the printed ones. Um, you're getting them here, but this is this is the same. This comes from the scroll. These these. I mean, they're very rough here because it's quite a rough thing. But the margins, top and bottom margins, and the guidelines. Um, but um, oh, where was the scroll? Somewhere back here. So I yeah. could have shown you, yeah. There it is. There yeah. Yeah, it yeah. Yeah. And you have prick marks and yeah. all sorts of different things. Much, of course, smaller margins, much more sort of larger use of the paper. Um, but to get written usually on one side. Um, What's the date? Uh, that would be about 8th century. But we have ones from earlier as well, just, you yeah. know. Yeah, uh, about, well, back to 15 years ago, 2001, I was, um, wanted to see the Stein collection at the National Museum of Delhi. And they have one room that has some of the stuff up. And I got permission of the museum director and everybody else to get the curator to show me what they had in store, in storage. And um, to make a long story short, I was unable to see that stuff for two reasons. I had to with, with the curator. Who told me this? First thing was that um, they didn't want it. It's been there for, for 80 years. And um, first thing was that he uh, only wanted India to see it so that they could get the credit for the translation, but nobody looked at it for 80 years. <laughs> and the second thing is that he confessed that he couldn't find it. Yeah. Has there been any progress since then? Oh, there's been enormous progress. I've been going out to India for the past 20 <coughs> years, and Dr. Sahai, who's still oh, the curator there, um, but <laughs> is still, um, there has been progress. A, a complete inventory of all the stuff was done a few years ago, so there is an inventory of all. It's all findable, and it has now has started to be digitized okay. and put on the National Museum of India's website, and we hope to link to them soon. We're talking about that soon, so it'll be on IDP, pulled from the National Museum of India website. Um, some has been published as well. I'm not talking so much about manuscripts here. Lokesh Chandra published the paintings, and that's enabled them to now become more widely available because I think he didn't want them becoming more widely available until he'd written on them. So there right. is that. But you get that scholarly, you get that all over. I mean, Russian curators won't let you publish anything until they've done the catalogue on that collection. That's a very common museum thing that curator wants to do their catalogue on the collection before letting it go out into the wider world. It's, I mean, we don't do that because we couldn't because we can't possibly ever get through stuff. But So it isn't unique to India, but um, as you say, there weren't a lot of people looking at it, but it has improved quite a lot. And I hope for the next few years, we'll get a, well, the next couple of years, we'll get a, um, proper MOU together with India and start making stuff a lot more accessible. So. Just another observation apropos of similar solutions to the problem 
Yeah. Uh, yes, I've no idea. I mean, yeah, your guess is as good as mine. It's it, that's true. There is that, and I mean, you do get free contracts or Exactly. Yeah. They often actually have a physical part and then a part that's, that's rolled up yeah. like a letter, and inside that is the contract sealed. Mm. So if anyone disputes the physical part, yeah, it's brought out. Yes, yeah. But that particular format of those wooden things is very specific. I mean, you could have done that on paper. You could have done it in other ways. So um, the fact that you use these very complex wooden things, but as you say, clay, interesting thing. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I just threw them out there because we don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, you want to ask me a question about the. Yes, um, I'm, you mentioned getting uh, very fine paper from very fine uh, skills like this. And, and, and of course, we also saw an example of the actual and this is how. Yeah. I mean, there were certainly a range of different people who worked on a scroll. Um, I mean, it's a good question about whether the scribe did the rulings or whether those were ruled by some person. Um, you know, it's a question I would have said off the top of my head from what I, what I remember, but I don't take this as gospel, that it was probably the scribal, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure about that. So um, Jean-Pierre Dresch has written quite a lot about this, and uh, Pau as well. So um, I'll go away and look and see if either of them say anything about uh, what process it was done. I mean, we know, as I said, the scroll was formed because a number of sheets of paper were discussed, how many sheets were needed, and then it was stuck together. and. Um, and we presume that, yes, all the, the wooden roller and stave were put on first and, and then the scribe started. Um, but yeah, as to whether the scribe did the rulings or whether somebody else did that. Um, it could be the scribe, because they had the expertise for that. I mean, you know, these are sometimes such fine lines, written with a brush and ink, remember. So... You know, drawing an exceedingly fine line, straight fine line. I mean, you had rulers and guides and things, but even so, that's not easy. Um, it, you know, it's a work of some master brushman. So, but perhaps we should ask our calligrapher colleague behind. No. <laughs> um, actually, I should look as well at modern tradition, at you know, people who still do these things, whether it's the scribes who do it today. Because these things are still made in um, copies, so it'd be interesting to see. Uh, I'll look it up. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, I thought it was very interesting picture you know, with the real similarity with all these manuscripts, right? But actually, what struck me is that, as, as I understand, Stein had removed all the manuscripts out of the cave, but that sort of doesn't seem to be the case because the way they're stacked up. Um, Stein didn't move them. The, the, the person who found the cave, Wang Yuan Lu, in 1900, moved them out twice, at least twice, before Stein turned up and put them back again. Okay. He moved them out to look what there was, put them back with no idea whether they're in the same order or a different order. Um, he gave some stuff away. So we have no, we have no evidence of the original order of the cave. And then Stein came and Wang Yuan Lu moved them out again for Stein to give him certain stuff and put them back. It wasn't Stein who did it. And then, so by the time Pelio turns up, 
Yeah, and the paintings by the time Stein was there, the paintings were at the bottom being squashed. So whether they were always at the bottom being squashed, and you saw all the poti as well, the big Tibetan mm -hmm. poti. Um, but that might have just been Wang Yu and Lu putting them back in a way that we have. Yeah, we can. I, I mean, the only evidence we have for the order of the cave is that the sutra bundles. Um, I think it's a reasonable hypothesis that he didn't unwrap all of those and look in them all. He just sort of cherry picked stuff, and so that a lot of the sutra bundles remained in their original. Um, that the, the, the scrolls stayed in the same, you know, order, um, and we are trying to reconstruct some of that because we have got some information. And it's showing quite interesting stuff, actually. But, um, we've got a little way to go. So I mean, 